comes from Matthew's Gospel, second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. And when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people of Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. So 2020, it's already been interesting. Georgia Tech beat Carolina. The Patriots got eliminated. I mean, what won't God do in 2020? <laughs> no, but Meredith and I, we were able to get out of town, and we were able to stay at a, con- a congregation member's house, and there wasn't internet, so we were kind of disconnected for a little bit. We were with family. Um, we were able to attend a Christian conference. It was exciting, and we came back late Thursday night, and I came into the office a Friday morning, just excited about life, <laughs> excited about what God might do and hadn't been on Twitter for a while, fired up Twitter and what's trending, the Methodist Church, World War III, and Australia is on fire. <laughs> and I was like, that escalated quickly. <laughs> like quite a lot happened in 2020. 2020 is already off to a roaring start. And historically, uh, the 20s have been fascinating decades. By 1720, saw maritime travel that led to the formation of some of the first corporations and companies, right? You think about like the East India Company. In the 1820s, it saw the industrialization that changed the way people lived and worked. At the 1920s, we sort of lovingly refer to as the Roaring Twenties, witnessed the birth of popular culture as mass forms of music, uh, film, and dance sort of exploded out into the world. And so on this first Sunday of 2020, I mean, what do the 2020s have in store? What do the 2020s have in store for us as a culture, as a people? What do the 2020s have in store for us as a church or even us individually? I mean, the start of a new year, even more so the start of a new decade is a moment in time where people are often open to opportunity, right? to anticipation, to hoping and dreaming for what might be, right? The start of a new year, the new decade, is a moment where folks are somewhat open to change. Maybe you've even seen some of those Instagram filters that flick above your head and say, in 2020, I will become. Many people are already thinking of what we will become, of what will become of us in 2020 and this next decade. I mean, this past week, have you found yourself open to change in some way. Maybe it's in goal setting. Maybe it's in New Year's resolutions. But this morning, I want us to dig in and and ask ourselves, what sort of change or transformation might God have in store for us here in 2020? I mean, our scripture this morning comes from Matthew's version of the birth of Christ. It's a continuation. And if you were with us before Christmas Eve, we talked a little bit about Matthew's version of Uh, Jesus' birth, how it's a little more matter of fact. You've got this long genealogy in chapter one. Then you've got a short story of uh, Joseph and his dream about uh, the birth of Jesus and the Messiah. And then it continues with, right, some wise men, a frightened king, 
and a slaughter of the infants if we keep going. Right? There's a reason, again, that we read Luke on Christmas Eve. Matthew's version, as a matter of fact, Matthew's version is, is even quite scary. Right? In Matthew's version, we meet these wise men from the east who observe a rising star. And they head to Jerusalem to pay homage to this king of the Jews. Because they assume, of course, this Jewish king must be born in the royal city of Jerusalem. Right? And once they get to Jerusalem to meet this child king, find out they were wrong. They were a few miles off. They meet frightened King Herod. I love how the scriptures say Herod was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. I have another sermon for another day, but it, I find it kind of interesting and beautiful that the birth of Jesus, right, it frightens those in power. So Herod, being frightened, he gathers his chief priests and scribes to inquire where this king is to be born. And it turns out that these wise men were about nine miles off, that the king was not to be born into the royal city of, or the capital city of Jerusalem, but in the humble city of Bethlehem. All right, so King Herod orders these wise men, quite kindly on his part, to continue their journey and to find this boy king. And he's kind of like, just, just let me know when you find him so I can go greet this new king. King. And once King Jesus is found, right, the wise men, they, they give him their gifts, and then they're warned in a dream, like a dream of God, to return home by another road, to escape the wrath of Herod, because of course Herod didn't want to welcome this new king. Herod wanted to, to squash the threat that this new king represented. So the wise men, right, they listen to the dream and they go home by another road. I mean, the birth of Jesus. Right, is an interruption. Right, it's an interruption into the world. It's an interruption into our life. It threatens and alters the ways in which we would choose to live our lives. I mean, this good news of a king being born to the, to the Jews doesn't sound like good news to all, especially good news to those in power. Right, again, Herod's frightened, so he wants to, to squash the threat of this new king. For the birth of Jesus suggests that Right, something has changed, right? that the world has changed, that something new has begun. Right? And that something new back then and even now is a threat to the old way of doing things. Right, for the wise men, right, the birth of Jesus launched them on a journey, right? a journey that led them from the east to Jerusalem to Bethlehem and then back home by another way. Right? They were seekers. They were on a journey searching for truth. And when they find, I like to think, when they find the truth of Jesus Christ, for them, everything changes. Right? That their encounter, even with this just baby Jesus, changed their plans. It changed what they were willing to risk. This encounter with even the baby Jesus changed their very lives. I mean, these wise men, as soon as they encounter this baby Jesus, they are suddenly willing to to risk their life, to go against Herod's orders in order to follow the dream. So this morning, how is God calling us as individuals, as a community, right, to change, to transform closer to the people that God has called us to be? Like what roads might God take us down? What roads might God take you down in 2020? And I think it's helpful when considering change is not only to, to look forward to what God might do. I don't know about you, but whenever the new year turns, I, I often want to look forward to what God you know, might do, whether it's New Year's resolutions, whether it's in, in goal setting. Right? I, I like to set a, aside some time to think through like, what God might do in the upcoming year. But I also think it can be helpful for us at the start of 2020 to look backward right, to what God has already done. Right, to look backward on the ways in which God has already been faithful. Because I think in looking backward at the ways that God's already been faithful, it helps us to look forward to what God might do. Because God has this funny way, right, when we look backward, of, of leading us down roads and paths that we otherwise wouldn't have chosen on our own. I mean, those magi, they rolled into Jerusalem, the capital city, expecting the coronation of a child king. Yet God led them down the road to Bethlehem, and then God led them down an unknown road back home. Because God takes us places we would never plan or imagine. Right? God's got this way of, of leading us down roads that we wouldn't map out. 
but they're often the roads that lead to the life that is really life. I mean, so I want to encourage you this morning to, to look back right, at your past decade. I mean, look at the past decade for us as a people and then as yourselves individually. I mean, the changes that occurred in politics and culture, right, in technology. If you were to tell your, your 2010 self the status of some things right now in 2020, I bet it would be pretty hard to believe. Right? When I look back at 2010, I was here. <laughs> right? not, even into my, not even a year into my first role as associate pastor, serving with you all and, and Reverend Curtis Campbell. Wasn't married, had no kids, lived by a house at the beach, and I didn't have internet. And it didn't matter that I didn't have internet. Right? It was glorious. Family's glorious as well. <laughs> right? It's all glorious. <laughs> but if you would have told my 2010 self that in 2020 I would be back <laughs> in the same sanctuary serving Kitty Hawk United Methodist Church, it would have been hard to believe. If you would have told my 2010 self that this would be the decade that the Cubs would win the World Series, <laughs> right? I would not have believed you either. I mean, the changes that can occur in a decade. Right? What God can do in a life, in a people, in a decade. Right? For me, right, wife, two kids, can't imagine not living without internet. <laughs> right? So much happens in a decade. Right? Jesus takes us places. Jesus takes us to people. Jesus takes us down paths that we could never map out or dream or imagine. You know, Meredith and I, we were able to spend uh, New Year's Eve with 65,000 college students at a Christian conference. You want to feel old, <laughs> spend a couple days with 65,000 18 to 25-year-olds, and you suddenly realize just how old you are, right? So we were able to, to spend a New Year's Eve there at a Christian conference, and that evening, uh, the speaker challenged uh, the college students and challenged them to consider that how they were living right now like in the 2020s, would set the stage and sow seeds for what their 2030s might look like. And I thought that was some helpful perspective. Because again, like when I sit down at the beginning of a new year, I just think about like the right now and maybe just this next year. And I think it would be helpful to take sort of the, the longer view. Right? That the way that we lived in the 2010s in some ways set the stage for our life in the 2020s. I bet if you looked you know, at your 2010s and what was going on a decade ago and, and the relationships and the habits and the priorities, right, that all of that kind of set the stage in some way, shape, or form for, for what your today looks like. Right, that the habits that we begin cultivating right now, right, that the ways that we're faithful to God right now, that the ways in which we answer God's call right now not only impacts our today, but it sows seeds that might bear fruit a decade from now. I mean, so what is God calling you to be faithful with right now? To whom has God placed in your hands to love with the very love of Jesus Christ right now? How is God calling you to be faithful in ways big and in ways that might seem small right now? I mean, maybe it's the cultivation of right, some holy habits, an intentional prayer life, study of scripture, taking on a, a season of silence. Like, what habits are you being called to cultivate right now that might not only change your today, but transform the next 10 years of your life? I mean, I think about the relationships that I've invested in, not only family relationships, but friendships, mentors, students. Right, how pouring into those relationships a decade ago right, are bearing fruit right now. I mean, this morning, I want to encourage you to, to think through your story. Right, how maybe insignificant, seemingly insignificant moments of faithfulness, right, saying yes to God here, saying yes to God there, right, saying yes to God through relationship with a local church, Right, sacrifices here or there, how, how saying yes to God right, a decade ago has led you to being in church <laughs> on the first Sunday of 2020. I mean, this morning, give yourself the space to consider right, the long view, 
And if you haven't already started you know, asking those questions or, or dreaming of, of what God might do this morning, give yourself an opportunity to do so. I mean, Jesus, what would you have us do at the beginning of 2020? Jesus, where are you calling me to invest my time, my energy, here at the beginning of, of 2020? Jesus, what holy habits do I need to sow into so that I can answer your call a decade from now? I mean, for those magi following the star, right, following God's star, whether they knew it or not, they were being obedient to following the truth, right, to following a dream. God wrote them into this beautiful story of faithfulness that we're reading about and recounting right, thousands of years later, all because they trusted that star, all because they, they said yes to Jesus. Right, that their encounter with the child king changed them forever, so much so that they were immediately ready to sacrifice everything to follow that dream. So this morning, how is an experience with the living God changing and transforming you? I don't know if some, all the change talk, it can create some anxiety, even looking back at this past decade, right, and all the ways the world changed around me, some in my control, some out of my control. It started to create just a tad of anxiety of thinking, man, like God, what, what is going to happen next? If all this happened 10 years, what's going to happen in the next 10 years? And even just thinking about family, 10 years from now, both my kids will be in high school, right? Creates anxiety, <laughs> creates nervousness. Just all the changes that, that might come can create a tad of anxiety, yet the constant, right? Year after year, generation after generation, is Jesus Christ and his love for us. So I don't know what changes might come in 2020. I don't know what changes might come over the next 10 years. But I do know that Jesus is faithful. Jesus is still working. Jesus' grace and love are still available for each and every one of us. And I do know that Jesus is still on the move. So as we transition into this new decade, may we do so reliant on the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Mighty and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for this day. God, we give you thanks for the gift of a new year. And we give you thanks that in this new year, we're able to gather together as your people to praise and worship you. God, as we look forward to the future of what's in store for what you might do, God, we pray that this very morning, Lord, you would speak to us. Lord, that we would create space in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives to hear from you for what you would have us to do right now so that we can be faithful to your call whenever that call might come. For it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.